I've always been an antisocial kid. As I grew up, I had no friends and barely interacted with my family. Some may say that I lived a boring life and that I wasted my youth in my room reading. I tend to disagree with them, uh, because in my opinion, time spent doing things you like is not time wasted. I can say that I've read hundreds of books, and I've grown to not be impressed by them anymore. Even still, I enjoyed the reading. Around eight months ago, I decided to read the poetic and prose Edda. At first I thought they were hard to read, and not for everyone. I'm not one to give up on books or leave things unfinished, so I carried on reading. I don't know what changed, as shortly I became obsessed with Norse myths and their culture. I began watching TV shows based on the Nordic and Viking culture, even though up to that point I considered TV a waste of time. I even started interacting with people online with the same interests as me. It was around the same time that I met Leah. She was a girl from Sweden, a few months younger than me, but still as obsessed with Norse stuff as I was. We soon got to talking on Discord. With her, it all came so natural, like we've known each other for a lifetime. In about six months, she asked me if we can be more than friends. I must admit that I've grown quite fond of her, so I said yes without hesitation. She then wanted to meet me in person. I insisted that I would go to Sweden as it was home to many of the Norse myths I was so interested in. After two weeks or so, I packed my bag and traveled to Sweden. It was a short flight from Warsaw to Linköping, and at the airport I found Leah waiting for me. Seeing her for the first time in person filled my heart with joy. The next few weeks have been the best in my life. The bond between Leah and me grew stronger, and for the first time in my life, I was uh, in love. I never thought I would genuinely get to care about someone so much. It was surreal in a way. I woke up one day and saw Leah grinning from ear to ear. Guess what? She said. I, what is it? I asked, barely awake. I was browsing the internet, and I found a pagan festival somewhere in Iceland. There'll be a lot of activities based on Norse culture and Viking customs. Hearing this made me very happy at the time. A Norse festival, where I could learn and see more about the way people lived back then, sounded like the perfect vacation. Are you serious? When is it? We're definitely going. It takes place in about two weeks, in a remote village in Iceland. It's set, then. We're going. And don't mind the expenses. I'm paying for both of us. At first, she refused I pay for both, but after I insisted again and again, she agreed. It's the least I could do, after she housed me all this time, and beyond that, changed my life for the better. We then left for Iceland, and soon arrived at the village the festival took place in. I must say that it was awfully quiet. I kind of expect lights and music, just like any other festival. But there were only some wooden cabins built like the ones from the Viking Age, and animal skulls and bones everywhere. A man, almost naked, wearing only a fur waistband and an elk skull on his head, approached us. Verkornia brother, he said without me understanding a word. Hello, said Leah. Ver herdum ai hirvai di hauti, er sadriat? She then continued. I had no idea what they were saying. I didn't even know Leah could speak Icelandic. I cleared my throat and said, Can you ask him if he speaks English? Before Leah could say anything, the strange man spoke. Yes, brother. I just didn't think we would have outsiders here today. It is a beautiful thing. Well, yes, I'm really fascinated with your culture, and I would like to learn more. Of course. Uh, how much is it to enter? I asked the man. All sons of Odin are welcomed here. This is our way of life, and not something to make money from. All right, then. Uh, you lead. We followed the man deeper into the village. Everyone was breathtaking and heavily reminiscent of the Viking settlements I saw in documentaries and movies. 
In the center of the village was a huge bonfire, and more than fifty people, dressed in furs and animal remains, were standing around it. Braisish, Idag taka fliri softi sia kana londin hontan. Vin munim taka villa muntisim, says the man from before. What did he say? I whispered to Leah. He asked them to welcome us. People raise their cups and shout, skull at us. We gather round the fire and gaze at the people a bit more until the night is in its full power. Two men come from the longhouse. One brings a sack full of mushrooms and spreads them among the rest of us, while the other one, holding a torch, shouts, Sauder kurmin timi firmir furtmina. I turn my head to Leah. She probably knows what I'm about to ask, so she tells me that they are about to make a sacrifice. A goat, most likely. The doors of the longhouse open widely as a man dressed in a white robe comes out. He goes to a wooden wall, where his robes are removed, leaving him completely naked. They shackle the man to that wall, and a young woman amidst us walks up to him. Without flinching, she stabs him in the gut, then fills her cup with the blood that's coming out of the poor man's belly. She stuffs the mushrooms in her mouth, then drinks the whole cup of fresh blood. I turn my head to Leah. I could read the terror on her face. So I hugged her, and turned her head around in order for her to avoid seeing that horror. What the hell is going on? I mutter. Then, the man that welcomed us before says, She is going to meet the gods now. But that is a living human being. How can you do this to him? I asked with a tremble in my voice. Enor chose this on his own free will. Dying as a sacrifice to the gods is an honor. I looked up to the bleeding man shackled to the wall and noticed that he is, in fact, smiling. Go on. It's your turn. Hearing those words sent chills down my spine. With all my being, I just wanted to run away from there as fast as I could. But I just... couldn't. I let go of Leah as I dragged myself forward. I grabbed the CX from the table, closing my eyes, and with a trembling and sweaty hand, I... stabbed the man. Sprinkles of blood splattered on my face as I opened my eyes. I look into Enar's eyes. They are filled with pride and not resents or hate even as I remove the knife from his belly. He's still smiling. I hesitate for a moment as the primal chanting of the people intensifies. Then I fill my cup with the blood that's pouring from the stab wound. I turn around and take a long look at Leah before I eat the mushrooms and drink the blood. Everything went to black. After what felt like an eternity, I awoke. I gasped for air before realizing I was in a pond. I swim to shore and look up. There stood a waterfall larger than anything I had ever seen. In fact, it was so large I couldn't even see the top of it. I was pretty sure it was larger than any skyscraper, real or fiction. Disoriented, I look around. I didn't know where I was, but one thing was for certain. Wherever I looked, it looked beautiful. Like a place straight from a fairy tale. Mountains and plains filled the horizons. I was overwhelmed with this. So much that I'd almost forgotten that mere seconds ago I just stabbed a man and drank his blood. In the distance, I hear hooves. I turned around and... There he was, a black stallion so dark that he absorbed all the light, his eyes glowing red. He was like a black hole galloping. He abruptly stopped in front of me, and as scary as he looked, he was in equal parts majestic. Hesitantly, I tried to pat him on the head. He then did the most unexpected thing. 
the horse turned his head towards me and started talking. His voice sounded like a chorus of a thousand people speaking at once, and the language he used definitely wasn't of this world. Yet, somehow, I understood what he said. You walk between the realms, not dead, yet not alive. Nine days you shall ride west, across a bridge of gold, where rotten flesh of gods, your fate they must decide. Ride west for nine days. I gathered that the Black Stallion is here to help me. Hesitantly, I hop onto the horse and begin riding west. I rode and rode, day and night, without feeling cold or warm, thirsty nor hungry, until I arrived at the bridge. It was an imposing structure made entirely out of gold. The sunlight reflected from it was blinding. I can take you no further, but beware of the dishonest ahead, for they hunger for blood. The horse then warps itself into what seems to be some kind of sword and falls to the ground. I bend over to pick up the sword and carry on. Out of pure curiosity, I look over the bridge. That was a mistake, to say the least. A river smoldering with blood and corpses twisted to express pure horror was flowing at an unimaginable speed. I almost vomit from the feeling of uneasiness that horror gave me. But again, I carry on. I was almost at the end of the bridge, when something that I swear wasn't there before appeared before my eyes. A bunch of disfigured corpses, full of cuts and bruises, some entirely burned, some with their necks hanging on the side and rope tied to them, and lungs on their shoulders. Without a doubt, those were the people that died a dishonorable death. The ones burnt alive, the hanged, and the ones that have undergone the blood eagle. The most brutal form of torture, where the victim would have their ribcage split open to resemble the wings of an eagle, and his bloody lungs pieced on his shoulders. I've heard of such things, but never thought someone would be so brutal to do it. Their twisted legs carried them towards me, as they muttered that inhuman language. My vision began to fade, as I almost fainted from the primal sense of fear, now awoken within me. But I shake my head and regain my composure. I take a fighting stance as best I could, considering I was no warrior, and wildly swing that sword at them. I managed to hold my ground and cut them limb from limb. I was now at the end of the bridge, and as I took a couple of steps for the first time, I felt a piercing cold through every bone of my body. A dense fog appears and covers everything. I could barely see three meters in front of me. Scared and disoriented, I pushed forward through that thick fog. The ground was slippery from all the snow. I then realized I arrived in Niflheim. The realm of ice and fog. Only the dead dwell here. Am I dead? I ask myself. No, it can't be. At that moment, I just wanted to give up and collapse in the raging blizzard until I saw a cave right in front of me. I enter and begin laughing hysterically. I manage to find shelter. I was thinking of starting a fire, but there was no wood in sight. I go deeper into the cave and notice a set of stairs leading up. What a drag, I thought to myself as I began going up. The stairs were in a spiral formation, and by the looks of it, hundreds of stories high, through which the daytime illuminated the place. I carry on for a couple of hours until I notice there is no light anymore. The night must have come. I try to find a comfortable position and immediately fall asleep from exhaustion. I wake up the next day and continue climbing to seemingly endless stairs. I've spent the whole day going up, 
Then, again, the night came, and I fell asleep on those cold stairs. This went on for fifty-seven days. On the last day, I finally managed to climb all the way to the top. I found a massive gate, decorated with runes and Norse drawings. There stood a deformed, human-raven hybrid, feathers covering his abdomen and chest, his inhumanly long arms almost reaching the floor, and two wings, bloodied and with many feathers missing, sprouting from his back. He took a long look at me, sniffing me, then grabbing my hand and licking it with his serpent-like tongue before I could do anything. You are not dead, said that monstrosity, again in that otherworldly language. Who, uh, what are you? I've been trapped in this nightmare for dozens of days now. You are not dead, so I assume you got here by other means. Yes. I drank some blood, and ate some mushrooms, and I woke up in a pond. I know that wherever I am, this is not Earth. You are now in Helheim, mortal. We don't get living beings here too often. So you are lucky that we cannot torture your soul. Still, you didn't earn your death. So the goddess Hell shall punish you. Punish me? What have I done to deserve this nightmare? Why have I been so foolish to drink that blood and get stuck here? Proceed through the gates and enter the halls of Hell. Your fate won't be a good one, so you better learn from this. My thoughts get interrupted by that creature. I go through the gates, and across that wooden bridge, memories flashing before my eyes. I remember when I was a child, then my grandfather's funeral, then seeing Leah. I open the gates of the hall in front of me, and instantly get stumbled by the pure darkness and the smell of rot. In the dark, I see eyes gazing upon me and screams of agony combined with sickening laughter. But above all, I feel a presence, so prominent and threatening, the ground trembles as huge footsteps approach me. A giant being hovering above all else lowers its head to speak. It was a woman. I could see only half her face, so beautiful, shining like the sun, with golden hair and a godly visage. The other half was very hard to see, but I could distinguish the rotten or scorched flesh covering her skull. Giant insects crawling through her eye sockets. This was Hell. The daughter of Loki. Casted by Aesir in the depths of Niflheim and granted domination over the damned. She opens her mouth and speaks to me. Her voice sounded like the combination between a growling man and the soft voice of a mother. You are not of mine, yet my halls you walk. This abnormal act shall disturb the roots. Thus, punishment you'll suffer for a hundred years to come. And when your flesh expires, to me, you shall return. The giant woman stands up and returns to the darkness. This whole encounter shook me to my core, and her words echoed within me. When your flesh expires, to me, you shall return. From the darkness, an old man, older than anyone I had ever seen before, approaches me. He then throws a whip and dagger at my feet, and his entire body turns to dust and is blown away by the cold wind. I grab the items and instantly feel something calling me in the dark. I try to resist, but I couldn't. As I get swallowed by the dark, my eyes adjust, and I begin seeing more and more decrepit old men 
with beards tangled around their ankles. They were all hysterically laughing and whipping or cutting flesh from evil and tortured souls, screaming in agony. I suppose this was my punishment, to torture the souls of the damned for a hundred years. As time goes on, I see my skin getting wrinkled and my beard growing long and gray. The days feel like years here, and my whole sentence feels like an eternity. I tried to stop, but again, I couldn't. Somehow I felt joy from this. At times I even laughed at their suffering. Am I losing my mind? I lost track of time. I gaze at my hands and notice that they're only skin and bones by now. I felt like an indefinite amount of time has passed. Suddenly, I feel a complete relaxation in every inch of my body. The voice of hell was calling for me. I approach the huge figure, still as beautiful yet grotesque as the day I got here, an eternity ago. She then speaks. Your time of service ended, and your duty is null. Return now to the living. She lays a big bowl made of gold, filled with pure water before me. I gaze at my reflection and smile sadistically. I was just a bunch of pale skin and bones. Light, long faded from my eyes. I then take a sip of water from the bowl. My entire body warps through a portal of pure light. Then, nothing. I felt a hand on my shoulder, and then hear the sweetest sound that fills every cell of my body with such primordial joy. It was the voice of Leah. Hey, are you alright? You dozed off for a couple of seconds. I instantly looked down, seeing the empty cup of blood in my hand. I threw it away and began looking at my hands like a madman. They were normal. I then hugged Leah as hard as I could, tears running down my cheeks. What is going on? I asked, overwhelmed by everything. You stabbed that man and drank his blood while the crowd was cheering. You then dozed off for like ten seconds. Ten seconds. I've spent an eternity in the halls of hell, torturing the damned, and that was nothing more than ten seconds. I didn't know if I should feel dread or happiness. I didn't even want to think about that during those moments. All I knew was that I needed to stop Leah from drinking that blood and suffering the same fate as me. I grabbed her by the shoulders and looked straight into her eyes. We need to run. Now. Then I grabbed her hand and sprinted back to the cab waiting for us outside of the village. To my relief, the driver was waiting for us there. I got in the car with Leah and prodded the driver to get us out of there as soon as possible. He understood and left. After that, I never told anyone what happened to me. All I told Leah was that drinking the blood was an unpleasant experience. She probably understood me, as she never pressed me for more details. Life went on. Leah and I got married and retired to a remote village near my hometown. We eventually had three children together. You could consider this a very good life, maybe even the dream life of some. I would agree if that horrific nightmare wasn't constantly haunting me, transforming every moment of my life into an insatiable inferno. Over the years, I've learned to cope with it, Leah and the children being my gates to a free mind. As I grow older and older, 
I fear more and more when I remember those words. The words of hell. And when your flesh expires, to me you shall return. <laughs>